everyone, please uh, welcome with me Rohan and Jose for the Mark Jubilees Fund. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we're here to discuss a relatively new feature that just made it in, that, that made it into Rook. Um, it's about how Rook can now use persistent volumes to access its storage rather than going through a uh, local host directly in Kubernetes. A fair warning, this may contain opinion speculations and bad jokes that are entirely our fault. Uh, please do not blame Red Hat, IBM, or the Rook project for anything we may or may not say. All right, who are we? Uh, I'm Jose, I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat. Um, I've been in and around storage for 10 years. I work with OpenShift Container Storage, or OCS, with a focus on Rook and Ceph. Um, I'm a project lead for the OCS operator, which we will not be discussing in this talk. That comes later. Um, and I tend to like hitting things, mostly drums. Over here, we have Rohan Gupta. He graduated from college in 2018. So young. Uh, he also works in OCS with me. Uh, he likes watching anime and riding motorbikes. All right, and here's where we're gonna go. Um, we're gonna go through a bit of a setup. I'm gonna skip a couple slides since most of you were already here for the Rook talk. Um, and then we're gonna go over how OSDs work, uh, worked then and now, um, and hopefully give a proper demo, uh, network permitting. All right, to start, storage in Kubernetes. Um, who here is familiar with general storage in Kubernetes, PVs, PVCs, and all that? All right, most of you, this should be fairly easy. All right, so um, you have PVs, which are the representation of the actual storage volumes in Kubernetes. You have PVCs, which, rec which represent a user or developer request to use storage. And you have storage classes, which are a point of PVCs to, cre to, bind, to, create, uh, to get access to and bind to PVs. Um, here's the general flow in a relatively small diagram. Um, slides will be available online if you want to look at it later, but uh, basically the user creates the persistent volume claim, the admin or operator creates the storage class, the PVC talks to the storage class, which talks to the storage backend, creates the persistent volume, which then gets mounted by the pod. All right, now to the new stuff, raw block PVs. Uh, this just went beta in 1.16, I believe. Um, and it allows Kubernetes to present storage to containers basically without a formatted file system. So uh, if you've heard about block storage in Kubernetes before this time, um, you weren't actually getting like actual block storage. What you were getting was a file system formatted onto a block device. Uh, but now with raw block PVs, um, Kubernetes is able to present a actual uh, to present just a file because you know it's Linux uh, that represents the block storage device the, the, the block storage device that uh, can be used by the application running in the container um, and many applications like databases MongoDB Cassandra uh, already are capable of leveraging uh, block devices for their storage with you know no additional configuration needed. Some of them require additional configuration if you want to use a pre-formatted file system. Um, and you know, generally avoiding the file system layer m will tend to increase IO performance and give you lower latency. So this was a much asked for feature for a while in Kubernetes. And the way they implemented this or the interface that they implemented for doing this is called the volume mode, which is a new field in both PVCs and PVs that specify, aha, I was wrong. It went beta in Kubernetes 1.13. There we go. So um, this basically takes one of two values and specifies how you want to access the volume, either in file mode, which is the default backwards compatible default. Uh, yeah, the backwards compatible default or a uh, block which is how you activate the new feature. And this field must match in both the PVC and the PV. Uh, this is similar to you know, any other uh, required field in a PVC that must match to a given PV to be bound to it. Uh, here you have the YAML because, you know, lovely YAML, don't we all love it? Um, 
And you see down on the left, uh, in regular uh, file volume mode, you can just omit this field, right? Because it defaults to file. Um, and it would be the same in, per, in a PVC. And over on the right, you see the normal way of specifying uh, where a PVC gets mounted inside the container using the volume mounts field, specifying the name of the PVC and the mount path where it appears. As, and you know, that's where the file system gets mounted. Volume mode block, on the other hand, you can't omit the volume mode, obviously. Um, even if you're using, so the support of whether you can use file or block um, is determined on a case-by-case -case basis for each storage provider in Kubernetes. So even if you choose a storage provider that somehow only supports volume mode block, those may come, um, you still need to specify volume mode block because obviously it will default to file and if your storage provider doesn't support file, your PVC and PV won't bind. Um, the thing to note is that there is now also a new field in the pod spec called volume devices. Um, this is where you again specify the PVC name, but instead you specify a device path, which is the name of the file that will represent the storage device. Now a quick note here, uh, volume mode and access mode are not the same thing, nor are they related. Um, access modes, uh, as you may be aware, um, specify how, a, how pods may interact with a given PVC. So RWX stands for read, write, many, meaning that multiple pods can read and write to the same PVC. Um, RWO stands for read, read write, once, which uh, means that only one pod can mount a PVC at a given time. Um, and the support of access modes versus volume mode is again dependent on a case by case basis for each storage provider. So um, just because, just because a, a storage provider supports RWX volumes in file mode does not necessarily mean they'll support RWX volumes in block mode. So you have to know a little bit about which storage provider you're using uh, to make sure that syncs up. All right, here's the slides I'm gonna skip since most of you are already here. Rook and Ceph, what is Rook? Rook operators following the operator pattern. Um, <coughs> we're specifically interested in the Rook Ceph operator since this is the first one to make use of this new uh, PVC, PVC feature. Um, and the main thing I want to go over here is that um, all the stuff daemons are, are uh, encapsulated in their own pods that run across various nodes in Kubernetes. Uh, the daemons we're interested in are the OSD daemons, um, which are the ones that actually represent the underlying storage and in fact are the pods that bind to, to the block devices. All right, OSDs. Uh, typically, local storage OSDs um, have access to our privileged pods that have access to the full slash dev directory of the host they run on. Um, so the way you set this up is that you define your storage nodes um, either by name, by labels, or you can use all nodes as specified here. Um, and then you can, then you have to specify your local devices and that can either be done by hand using, uh, uh, using PV YAMLs or you can just use, uh, use all devices and make use of Rook's auto discover daemon. Um, and then Rook takes care of the rest, right? So it has an OSD prepared job that goes out and finds the devices and formats them appropriately to be used by the OSDs and then assigns given PVCs to particular OSDs. The advantage of this is that it's really, the base case is really easy to configure. Um, and for many people, many storage admins coming into this in particular, or in fact, just anyone who's ever played with the Linux system, uh, this is very familiar, right? Because you're just directly accessing a given device at a given name on a given host, 
right? Um, and it supports any type of device or appliance that Linux supports, right? Because all we care about is a file. As long as there's a file representing uh, that given block, get that given storage volume, we can make use of it. The downside is, in, at least in my opinion, is that this relies on specialized storage nodes, right? So if you have a Kubernetes cluster, you need to have at least some of those nodes uh, have local devices attached to them, which may not be your standard compute node that you're using in the cluster. Um, and in this case, there's a rigid coupling between your compute and your storage, um, meaning that you know if a given if a given node goes down, it brings down not only that node but the storage that goes along with it. So we implemented something called storage class device sets. It's a bit of a mouthful, I know. Um, so once again, uh, you define your storage nodes in your Rookcef cluster, uh, names, labels, or all, but then. You don't define your individual disks, or you don't even, yeah, you don't define your individual disks. You define a desired amount of storage, right? So, um, and then Rook takes care of the same automation as before, uh, preparing the OSDs and starting the OSD pods. Um, what does this mean in that case? So, uh, real quick, here's what a storage class device set looks like. Um, it was designed to be a generic Rook struct, but currently only Rook Ceph is using it. Um, you have to specify a name to give your set a unique identity that can map to the PVCs it generates. So what this is going to do is it will dynamically provision a, uh, a, a PVC, a single PVC for each OSD pod. Right? So now uh, you're not going out and finding devices to attach your OSDs. You are defining your OSDs and creating devices for them. Um, and then count is the number of devices you want in this set. So you want, you know, 100 gigabyte devices. You want five of them uh, in this particular set. You specify five there. We have a portable field that defines whether PVCs are allowed to move between nodes or not. Again, this depends on your underlying storage provider. Um, some of them do allow PVCs to move between nodes, some of them don't. Um, and then you have volume claim templates. Um, it is a list of PVC specs. That's all it is. Um, currently, only one is supported for Rook. We're looking to enable for a couple more. Um, in the future to take to make use of more advanced features in Rook stuff. Um, and yeah, if you're at all familiar with the PVC spec, uh, basically it's just the it's just anything that can go into spec. Pros about this, as far as I'm concerned, um, it offloads device distribution, right? So if you wanted to have robust storage, you would generally have to make sure that your devices were properly distributed across nodes, across zones, across data centers. Um, whereas in this case, you can programmatically define what that distribution looks like, and the devices will be provisioned at that distribution automatically. Um, and presuming your, store, your underlying storage allows for it, you can migrate devices between nodes. Um, works with any raw block PV, regardless of driver. So if Kubernetes supports it, you can use it. Um, and it's shiny and new. Some people like new features for the sake of them being different. Um, on, the, on the downside, this requires predefined storage classes. So instead of having your previously defined devices, you need to have a previously defined storage class, um, which can only be done by a Kubernetes cluster administrator. So if for some reason, uh, if somehow you're running Rook on someone else's cluster, you'll need the admin to create the storage class for you. Um, as, while I said that you know anything that's supported in Kubernetes is acceptable, this is also limited only by what Kubernetes accepts, right? So there must be a storage driver already existing in Kubernetes for you to make use of this. Um, it's also not as simple to configure. The base case, 
right, is inherent is inherently more complicated to set up than uh, the base case for how OSDs used to be definable. Um, and it's new and different. Some people are suspicious of new features, especially when they haven't been, you know, tested in the field yet. All right. And now we're going to go into some bumps in the road that we ran along the way in trying to implement this. So we as developers, when we write code, and we think that when we will hit uh, build, it should just build and work out of the box. But that's ne uh, never the case, right? So these are some of the issues which we face while writing this feature. So OSG pods run as privileged pods. So when Kubernetes presents a uh, block device to the privileged pod, it's uh, uh, bind mounted and it's uh, presented in a different way. So we don't get our block devices in the privileged containers. And we uh, really needed our block devices on top of privileged containers because we were using LVM and we needed that. So we uh, uh, figured out a workaround. So what we did, we had a, a common shared uh, uh, directory uh, on an init container. <laughs> And we uh, attached the block device to the init container, which was not privileged. And the OSD container was running as a privileged container. And as the shared directory was there uh, in the init container as well as the privileged container, we found a way to copy the block device there to make it work. I don't know if it is uh, visible or not at the back. But here uh, on the right-hand side, if you see, there is an empty di directory that is uh, set1, dev1, bridge. And we have a block volume that is uh, set one dev zero. That's uh, that's mounted on the init container. Here on the left hand side, we have the main OSD pod, which has the only which has only the uh, bridge directory. And what init container is doing? It's copying the set one dev zero device to the shared directory there. And the shared directory is here, so. We get the block device here on the uh, main OSD container. As we know, uh, in Linux, everything is presented as a file. So we are just copying a file via the init container, and we are getting it here on the uh, main OSD container. <coughs> so the next issue which we uh, faced was when we were spinning up multiple OSDs on the same node. So we had the slash dev mounted on top of the container, and the block device was presented to the pod as a loopback device. So what was happening was that uh, LVM was picking up the uh, device from the slash dev as well as the loopback device, and it was getting confused which device to pick for. And the Ceph OSG start command was the uh, main thing that was confused for this. So the solution we found out was we have to use the complete uh, name of the LV, that is slash dev, the name of the VG, then the name of the LV. And the other issue which we faced was proper distribution. So when we, suppose we are uh, having uh, six OSDs and on three nodes, all the OSDs were coming up on the same node, which is very, uh, which is re really not desired, because we have the replicas of uh, OSDs. Suppose the replica is three, and all the three replicas are on the same node, and if the node goes down, so we lose all the uh, devices, which is really bad for us. So we uh, to solve this, we use placement affinities. Now the most interesting part. The demo. And we have a pic of cute cat that's spraying. Hope this works. OK. So uh, we have three OSDs running here, which uh, one is on 247, one is on 233, and one is on 156 nodes. And if we see the status uh, of Ceph, it's uh, healthy. And we are using an OpenShift cluster because uh, internal uh, automation makes it easier for us to spin the clusters. So, we're using Red Hat because Red Hat. <laughs> uh, we have four worker nodes here. So, OSDs are on three nodes. And what we are going to do is we are going to delete one of the nodes, which has an OSD running on it. And that uh, OSD is going to migrate on another node. So uh, 
I'm going to delete this 156 machine and hope the OSD is migrate to the different node. And for 156, um, yep. Here is the machine for that. Okay, we deleted the machine, and uh, one of the OSD went to the pending state because it's looking for the uh, node. And we see there is another OSD that also in a pending state because it's looking for a new node to uh, jump to. And okay, the toolbox. Did the yep. toolbox? There we go. Yep. So. Uh, one of the mon is down because it was there on the node, which I deleted. And we have three OSDs, two are up, and three are in. So uh, one OSD that is in pending state is the one which uh, was lost because of the machine which was deleted. And let's wait for it to come back on another node. Do you see get pods on the, on the storage uh, namespace? Oh, it's already running. Yep. Oh. So uh, the OSD is back. Uh, and in some time, the health will be okay. There it is. So it's still in warning because of the mon is down. Yep, but the OSD pod came back up. So yes, and then at some point, the Ceph cluster will reconcile. But our feature succeeded. <laughs> oh, and it just went health okay. All right, thank you. But wait, there's more. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Uh, you may have noticed that we omitted one key thing that some of you may be interested in. What about on-premises? So uh, I kept talking about you know, OSD portability and uh, migrating between nodes and all that, which is all great for cloud environments. And know? the demo was on AWS. Right. But, you know, we don't necessarily... We, it sounds like we're leaving, you know, traditional on-prem... Um, storage in the lurch, not the case. Uh, because also in Kubernetes 1.14, we have the notion of local block PVs. So, uh, or rather also in 1.14, we have the notion of local PVs, which when combined with the, when, which when combined with the block PV gives you obviously local block PVs. Um, and it allows you to access local volumes via the PVC PV interface rather than specifying a direct host path on a given node in the pod spec, right? So this is trying to decouple the uh, specification of local storage from a pod to a separate entity. Um, and the way this works is that you create a local PV with a storage class name and you have to specify a node affinity. So you see there in bold, there's the storage class name, above it is volume mode block, and then a node affinity that specifies what node this device is on. All right? Um, so then, what you have to do is create a storage class using no provisioner, right, because the device already exists, so there's nothing to provision in that case. And then you specify something called volume binding mode equal wait for first consumer, which enables a new feature called topology aware provisioning. Um, what this does is that it allows the Kubernetes pod scheduler to take into account the locality of the PV the pod is binding to. All right, so when the scheduler is calculating what nodes the pod can be scheduled on, it will, you know, it will uh, ping the PV spec to see if it has any uh, locality information, like a node affinity, um, and input that into its algorithm to get a list of valid nodes. Um, and then after that, you just create your PVC and pod spec as normal. Um, so in this case, you would just create another PVC that specifies, oh yeah, it's right there, that specifies the local storage, um, storage class, which I just made these slides like 30 minutes ago, so I guess I forgot to specify the storage class. Um, 
and then you make sure the parameters match the PV you want. Uh, read, write once, block mode, same storage size, uh, and that's it. So there's a lot of work on the back end for the administrator to take care of, right? Because the administrator is the one that wants to be creating the local PVs and the storage class associated with it. But from the developer point of view, and right, don't we all just love developers and making their lives easier? Um, it's no different than using any other storage. All right, thanks again. <laughs> Questions? Question time, anyone? We got one. You. I need that. I need that. Oh, hold on. Give it him. Just yeah. repeat it. You mentioned Rook and OSDs using um, block level PVs, but what about uh, Rook providing block level PVs with RBD for other applications that want them? That is dependent entirely on the. Oh, yeah. Uh, what about Rook providing block mode PVs from, from, from like, say, RBD in Ceph? Um, that is entirely dependent on the storage driver itself, not the operator, and I'm happy to say it's supported in Ceph CSI. So Ceph CSI RBD will support block mode PVs. All right, I'm gonna say either I was not very interesting or I was very, or I described myself very well. I have a so, question. Oh, here we go. Uh, um, a duplicate PV issue in LVM, any reason you didn't solve that by uh, LVM filters? Uh, duplicate PVs in <laughs> duplicate PVs in LVM. Uh, any reason why we didn't solve that in this feature? Uh, quite frankly, because I'm not aware of it. So uh, I can look into that and see what we can do about it. Yeah, you can just tell LVM to ignore certain devices with the regex. So if you have like that blue, whatever, you just tell LVM to ignore that, and this error will go away. We didn't know that. There you go. Right, so uh, apparently there's a feature, you can just use a regex to have uh, LVM ignore certain devices, but. We didn't use that then. Or did, I'm I mean, wondering if that wasn't because we couldn't guarantee the name of the device. Um, no, we had the name. Okay, so yeah, might be something to look into again. Sure. All right. All right, we good, thank you. Nice. Well done.